Hello. Sir, uh, sir got disconnected. I will start, sir. Sir will join. Is it uh, due to? Is it from my connection? Yeah. Yes, sir. It's echoing. Oh, yeah, I have joined from you. Sir, uh, you have uh, two systems. One is both are connected. I think one is uh, looping with the other, and that is causing echo. Yeah. Now should be okay, sir. Yeah, I minimized and joined again. I think that is why it is same link only. Okay. okay. Now I think it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Told me you will be seen twice. <laughs> okay, so we'll start, sir. Okay, we can start. I think Dean has joined. I think no. Or there is also yeah. can start. Yeah. He has joined, sir. Yeah. Good afternoon, friends. A welcome to the forefront of future frontiers, the medical webinar series. We are now in series 10. The theme for series 10 is how we can enhance the quality and safety of care for uh, uh, our patients in the healthcare system. So that's the theme we are exploring. Uh, we have uh, had a, quite a few talks in this particular theme. And today we have uh, one very interesting talk on how to improve safety in surgical fields, how to bring in training in the form of surgic simulation in surgery and how it can enhance the quality of and safety of care in uh, uh, surgical patients and we have with us dr ram natraja he's a pediatric surgeon from monash university australia he'll be delivering the talk i'd request our dean dr kotu to welcome the speaker and uh, after that we'll proceed to introduce him over to you dr kotu Uh, he has some issues, uh, Vishnu, but sir, can you welcome the speaker so that I'll go on with that? 
Oh, some other man. Sir, Dad, please, shall I talk? You then? can go. Please. Yeah, yeah, please. So, on behalf of uh, Dean and uh, management, I welcome Professor uh, Natarajan. So, it's a very great event for us because uh, you will be talking about uh, usage in the skill learning on simulation because this is an important, especially when the cases uh, are not easily available and also it's a surgical skill which probably cannot be taught easily with the liver live patients. And in this simulated uh, mod model, people can practice as many times as many, uh, they want and also they can become themselves well acquainted with the procedure before they actually go into the uh, real patients. This, uh, your uh, screen has gone. Hi, yes, sir. So he has done his uh, bachelor degree in medicine and surgery. I thought he will uh, speak in uh, Indian accent, but he's in the Western accent. So he's been trained in the UK and uh, he has done molecular medicine and uh, basic medical sciences and postgraduate training he has done in pediatric surgery and he's director of surgical simulation and innovation. And uh, anywhere in the Western country and down countries, uh, I think yes, simulation and uh, skill learning on simulators has become more important and it's what a vast experience. And in India also because of COVID situation, we are in a situation where we cannot directly handle patients in many situations and also crowding and management also becomes an issue. So I think under these circumstances, this uh, simulated uh, patient learning is very important. And he has uh, worked in various places and uh, he's also uh, trained in the Royal College of uh, Surgeons and he's uh, presently in uh, and the country lead uh, for minor Children's Hospital, and he's also a temporary advisor for WHO on simulation. And uh, definitely will be benefited by his expertise. And he's got uh, several accomplishments, like he has written uh, eight book chapters, 65 peer reviewed publications, and uh, several international conferences. I think any surgical conference will not be there without uh, simulation being shown because many issues may have to be shown and often there will be a workshop on simulators also and he has conducted 11 courses in the country over the last four years and various education and clinical awards i am sure that he will visit pondicherry and avmc and uh, give training to us also in this field so thank you uh, ram Natrajan, for uh, being with us and obliging us to come in over here on the if not in real life on the web. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Uh, before we proceed, uh, we'd just like to give a little brief about how, what work Dr. Ram has done. He actually is very interested or passionate about simulation and how we can take simulation for safety of surgical procedures in developing countries. So uh, when we were in that Harvard Macy project uh, course together, we, he was in the same group he was supposed to present a project and his project was how to take uh, simulation and make it really low cost for the developing countries. And he has done extensive work in Myanmar as Monash University lead for this particular uh, thing. So that's why we requested him to share his extensive experience on how to bring plan for these sessions and how to bring this into surgical education. So with that uh, introduction, we'd request Dr. Ram to take the stage and uh, we request all participants to keep themselves muted so that the audio quality is good for everyone. And this session is being recorded for the sake of uh, academic purpose and uh, for later use. Over to you, Dr. Ram. Uh, the stage is yours. Dean wants to tell something or some problem there? Dean. He has some issues with him. Fine, fine. <laughs> Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It was a great honor to get the email from you, uh, from a fellow uh, Harvard Macy scholar, um, to share my experience in this space. And I think 
Um, as the kind uh, introductions have said, that uh, simulation is certainly coming more to the fore uh, with medical and surgical education. So uh, hopefully this will give you a bit of an overview on what uh, we're doing at the moment, but also what is possible both uh, at both ends of the spectrum as well. So I'll just share my screen now, um, which is here. Let's have a look. Good. Um, can everyone see that? Very good. So um, this is kind of far reaching things. So I'm going to be talking about simulation based uh, education and also the use of technology uh, to improve clinical outcomes. And I'll be drawing on uh, some of our experience with um, Myanmar, where we've actually had some uh, good data come through for actually improving clinical outcomes because of low cost simulation as well. But we'll come on to that. Um, certainly, uh, it's traditional here, and I'm sure it's traditional in, in uh, your uh, country as well, but I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm gathered on today and acknowledge your um, elders past, present and emerging as well. Um, so this talk, I was going to talk about uh, five different domains, and I think I certainly left some time for questions at the end, and I do welcome questions then. Um, and one of the things I'm going to be talking about, what is simulation? What are some of the educational theories underpinning it? Um, an overview of some surgical simulation examples that you may uh, be able to apply. Um, how can technology be harnessed in either a low and middle income setting or high income setting? I'm going to be talking a bit about the future, which we're using a lot of our projects are now using uh, wearable technology and how we're going to apply that to simulation. And then talk a bit about on the global surgery stage, as we said, uh, actual proof of uh, clinical outcomes improving because of a uh, surgical simulation intervention. So what is simulation? So uh, I'm not sure some of you probably will recognize this gentleman here, but he was William Halstead, who was uh, one of the pioneer um, surgeons in America, who uh, formed many things. He was a godfather of surgery there. Uh, he was uh, the founder of one of the Job Hopkins uh, institutions there, and it certainly formed the uh, backbone of what we do. And I'm sure you've all heard his expression, see one, do one, teach one. Uh, although it doesn't feel that long ago when I started surgical training in 2002, uh, certainly that was still very much prevalent within our training program. It's interesting when you look at it, though, that the other things that William Halstead actually pioneered as well was the use of antibiotics, uh, to wash your hands before doing an operation, to wear surgical gloves, and to not use the blood splattered aprons as well. So. Um, I think that uh, for those other things that he pioneered, it's uh, almost unbelievable that we would not use them today, yet we are still in many areas still clinging on to his expression for training, which is see one, do one, and teach one. So why simulation? So simulation, uh, usually I say, you know, people have flown to this, but this is the beauty of the paradigm shift where we're virtual conferencing. Um, but simulation is for people to train and we learn from the aviation industry. So simulation not only teaches a pilot how to actually land a plane or to fly a plane, but also those really ingrained uh, um, technical and non-technical skills that allow them to land a plane when something untoward happens, like a sudden guff of wind blows them off the um, air, off the uh, tarmac. Because it's not so necessarily the uh, straightforward uh, flying the plane that's an issue, it's more about the fact when things go wrong. And that happens in our world as well. So it's not just the routine operation which we need to make a difference, it's actually the operation where things go wrong. And bear in mind, pilots do thousands of hours of training before they're actually allowed to fly a plane. It's the same for this is the Royal Albert Hall. For those of you who've been to London, it's one of a, it's near where I grew up and it's an amazing place. But certainly if you were playing your musical instrument at this high level, you wouldn't just uh, turn up on the day and expect to play it and play it to a good degree. So you do practice as well. Same with Usain Bolt. He doesn't just rock up on the Olympics uh, and just, uh, just sprint and then win all these gold medals. He practices, he trains, he really drills himself with that. And so should we. And this drilling is actually one of the first educational theories I introduced, which probably as surgeons, we always know. So that's deliberate practice. And this was uh, Anders Ericsson, who basically said that it's the active engagement and deliberate practice. And that's where you're actually focused on doing a task. 
you do the task, you get feedback, you problem solve, you value, then you repeat the performance again and again and again until you actually gain competency. And this is a, a graph which has basically been applied to surgical training, where people say that the peak of your career comes sort of after about uh, 30 years or so, but it actually takes you 10 years or a certain number of hours to reach that international level. Uh, but as our understanding increases, um, what we actually realize is that different people have a different curve. So people will reach the international level and the peak of their career at different times, and different people will actually need different trajectories to maintain that. This is Mastery Learning uh, by, Day, uh, by James Block, and this is where actually we can, we can scaffold things. So where we actually then, you achieve one target, you deliberately practice until you get to the next target, and then the next target along. And these are the two uh, main um, educational theories that underpin our surgical training, but there are many, many more that underpin what we do. And I'm sure all of you who are actually educators in the medical and surgical fields will actually probably use them already, although you may know them by different names. So what is simulation-based education? So my definition for it is the acquisition of essential technical and cognitive skills in a safe controlled learning environment prior to patient contact, hence ensuring patient safety and clinician preparedness. Um, and I say uh, cognitive skills because I, I like I, the uh, traditional way to describe them is non-technical skills, but I feel that non-technical implies that they're not as good as technical. It kind of downgrades them a bit. You've got the technical, then you've got the non-technical, but actually they're cognitive skills and they're very important. So what is it? Bench trainers, part task trainers, I'm sure you've all seen these kind of mannequins, you've practiced on them, you've done, uh, you've probably used laparoscopic simulators as well in your practice, and these are all part of simulation. We use scenario based for uh, a common thing for us would be APLS or ATLS or VLS, where we use a mannequin to practice resuscitation based around a scenario. We have screen based learning, which is incredibly more prolific now in the, in the area of COVID. And suddenly, all of our educational meetings are now and courses are actually being moved online. And we're actually now running huge uh, portfolios of programs uh, just based on screen. We have hybrid, and this is where you're using an actor with a synthetic put onto them, where the trainee has to suture the wound closed while talking to the patient who is anxious. And you can really up the ante of how that simulation goes. Cognitive skills, how do we, and those are the things that really make a difference because when you do a root cause analysis of critical events in, a, in an operating theater, which is my world, the majority of them aren't because the equipment didn't work, there was a lack of surgical expertise. It's usually a Swiss cheese effect, but it's usually because of lack of communication, situational awareness, or other factors that come along there. But they can be taught in sim as well. And I think everyone thinks that uh, simulation may be just based within the virtual reality uh, space, but it doesn't have to be. And that's where hopefully one of the take home messages of this talk will be. And also sim patients, incredibly powerful, but it's a new uh, form of simulation where they're actually now becoming a professional uh, entity where they actually train, not just actors that help us, but they're actually based as your simulated participants as well. So see one, do one, teach one, not quite. And we're not trying to actually just recreate the surgery itself or the procedure or the intubation or all those other factors. We're actually trying to create everything around that as well. This uh, picture sums up uh, for uh, what I think simulation is. And this is uh, Maurizio, who's one of my close academic colleagues. And this is when we were running a trauma workshop in uh, rural Gippsland. So uh, right out in the heart of, of the countryside in, in, our, in our state of Victoria, very under-resourced. And we are obviously teaching medical school uh, students about trauma. What Maurizio is showing here is the intraosseous needle insertion, a, a procedure that's life saving where you have to really screw a needle into the bone of a child just below the knee just to give them fluids if you can't get intra intravenous access but if you look at the students expressions you can see those are the kind of reactions i want students to have in a safe environment with a mannequin and not where actually they need to do this procedure to save a child's life i don't want them to have those reactions there very good uh, high fidelity simulator and this is it here but actually what it is, and this is where we come into the low cost, it really teaches them how to do it. You've got the hard stuff and then you get it really crunch as it goes in, but it's a chocolate bar. 
I'm not sure you have them in India, maybe you do, but crunchy bars. So honeycomb center surrounded by chocolate and we wrap them up in elastoplast. And actually the fidelity of putting the needle through that, you have the resistance of the elastoplast and then it suddenly gives way into the crunch as you did for the bone um, going through into the cortex as well. Very high fidelity, very low cost and it works. Well, we do have high technology and this is Sim Junior. Um, and Sim Junior is the good realism in terms of it, how it looks, the pupils and everything. And I can control it with my um, control rooms here and control the heart rate, the blood pressure and all those things. But actually this is expensive. This is 80,000 Australian dollars. And for that, I do use it. Um, but actually you can train a lot more people with less money, with just more educational design. So this is the non-technical skills or cognitive skills. And this is my, it uh, looks relatively empty. This was after we just opened it. It's a lot fuller nowadays, but this is my operating theater space. Um, but here, when people see it, they always say, oh, this must be where you teach surgeons to operate. And I say, no, it's not. I can teach surgeons to operate at home uh, using laparoscopic remote um, training. This is where I teach them decision-making, interprofessional skills, crisis management, leadership skills, team working, situational awareness and communication, all within a safe environment. Real factors that really can make a big uh, difference to patient outcome in a safe environment. And you can have the team of anesthetists, the surgical team, you have the nursing team, all interacting and actually giving uh, different scenarios as they go through to teach students and surgical trainees, medical trainees, anesthetic trainees, all these essential skills. So let's go through some examples of sending my word of surgical simulation examples. And I'm certainly using my uh, hat of a, a surgical simulator here rather than as a, a medical educator in the Department of Pediatrics. Um, but whenever we think of simulation, we think of that high fidelity, that stuff that looks real, the virtual reality, the robotic surgery. Those are the kind of things, the really high cost things that we think of. But this is where it started for me. This is my double glove model, which we designed with uh, Joe Curry, one of my uh, close mentors at Great Ormond Street in London in 2002. Very low cost. In those days, this is Barrett um, doing the procedure. We had to go after hours. You might recognize the old uh, store stack systems. I had to bring a supply of chocolate to the theater staff to let me use them and promise them that I would never, wouldn't break anything. Um, and we had to do this all over out of hours and we had to do it all within there. And that was our first validation study. Now we've got these portable bench trainers, which I'll show you how we apply them, which cost about $1,000. We can use them with any tablet and have exactly the same capabilities as what we used in that setting back in uh, 2002. This is a video of the double glove. And you can see here, actually what it is, is we're dissecting out the, uh, um, the oval. So the red oval in the middle. It's the inner glove is filled with water, so you don't want to perforate that inner glove. Um, and you don't want to deviate from the red um, uh, line either. And this is teaching all of the essential skills or many of the core skills that you need for laparoscopy. But it doesn't look like an operation. It doesn't look like anything that we would do. Although I'm a pediatric surgeon, I can never say never. There may come a time when I need to dissect a glove out of a child um, if they do something funny. But this is not actually looking like we'd expect a real operation to look, but it confers the skill that we need to do it. It confers the 2D to realization and all the other ones that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and we validated this, and I think this is also part of my journey is that it took us about three years to get these both papers actually to publish with uh, Joe and myself. Um, and it was rejected from journals um, saying, this is, this is nonsense. You, don't, you have to teach surgeons how to operate in an operating theater. There's no place in medicine for this. So even in my short career so far, I'm very uh, glad that we've come to a point where now uh, globally we're thinking about surgical simulation and actually incorporating these new practices uh, within all of our medical student and postgraduate training programs. Um, and these are the kind of simulation that we use. Again, doesn't look very specific to what we would do, but these are all low cost. Dissecting paper, threading uh, the laces, putting rubber glove caps onto pegs, folding bits of paper, putting them through pegs, uh, stacking dice, untangling paper clips, and the double glove model. And these are just a few examples of very low cost laparoscopic simulation that works very well. You'll notice in these that for the majority of them, I've actually got a red and a, and a blue 
uh, um, color on the instruments themselves. And we'll come on to that just in a second. And you can see here, this is part of our example of our courses in Myanmar, where we can go anywhere in the world um, and you can actually, without electricity, although you have lighting here, we can set up these simulators using portable power sources and um, uh, tablets to actually teach all these laparoscopic skills at the back of a classroom in the middle of a hospital in downtown uh, Yangon. And you can see people are having fun. People are getting engaged with it. They're learning, they're teaching. We can demonstrate on it. And we did donate quite a few of these to them. And until the recent um, unfortunate events there, um, uh, they were actually building up and up with their surgical simulation program. But of course, this is the high fidelity. This is what I do in my center, where we have the big uh, sort stacks and we actually do our own simulators there covered in the drapes. Gives the better fidelity where you've got someone holding the camera while you're using it. And that's the other end. So you can beat both ends of the spectrum for laparoscopic sim. We have an expensive stack, you've got laparoscopes, but you can do it in a box trainer. So we train our uh, trainees on a stepwise approach, as we said, building up the blocks as we go. They start on the basic simulator, they then move up to more and more complicated things as they go. Um, and this is the lid. So this is the lid we designed, and this is a small MDF uh, triangle with some holes cut into it. We then cut a glove off, we put the fingers of the glove in the holes, stretch it across there, and that gives one side of it, which is a, an inguinal hernia repair in a child. So you can see here on the other side, we just put some neoprene on, and you can see here, this is actually two of our common procedures. So the top one's a congenital diaphragmatic hernia repair, and you can see that actually the model there is tying a suture with a slip knot under tension. Now, bear in mind that I'm suturing this diaphragm closed in the, in the top image in probably a baby's chest that is, is smaller than my fist. So it's a very small space where I'm operating and I'm actually suturing and the needle looks huge, but it's a tiny needle um, because of the magnification, it looks huge. So what do I do? I, I'm a good surgeon, I hope, um, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that you know, my outcome's as good as anyone else's. But when I, before I do a thoroscopic diaphragmatic hernia repair, I go to my model. And I actually fire off 30 of these special sutures. So when then I do it in the patient, it's the best suture that I can do. So it's not just about acquiring those skills, it's about actually maintaining them as well and for warm up exercises. And why do I do that? Because not every congenital diaphragmatic hernia is suitable for thoracoscopic repair. If they're not suitable for every four, so I'm to do what I can. You can see the inguinal hernia here very low cost where we're doing a purse string model and going around. Now you may say this looks all like a bit of fun. You're just playing around with a bit of neoprene and a glove that you cut in half, but there has to be evidence behind it. So we run also validation studies and we put 109 surgical trainees through on the lid model. We tested our, our scoring systems. So we looked at how many times did they, uh, did they rip the glove? Was the knot suit was sound? Was it watertight? You know, were the actual the sutures did they go down? Did they break? We have a scoring system. Put 109 uh, trainees through it. And you can see here it differentiated between those three groups, from the novice to the intermediate to the expert. Bit of crossover in the intermediate group because that's you know it's very easy to define a novice. It's very easy to define an expert because they're two ends of the spectrum. In between, it's a very mixed bag, but that was still significant. And we obviously published it and it was all significant. So it does work. So not only is designing these low cost simulators, it has to be on a good basis that is actually validated as well. And the double glove. So we're doing all of these things. So some are specific, some are not specific to operations, but it teaches us the 2D to 3D realization. Altered hand-eye coordination is no direct visualization of the operating field. The increased fine motor skills as we've got longer instruments which amplify our hand movements. The fulcrum effect, when I move right, the instrument moves left. And I guess your brain has to get used to that as well. You don't have as much haptic feedback. You have altered depth perception, oops, sorry. And all of those things you can teach within laparoscopy. So the, although these aren't don't look like a actual operation, all of these skills can be picked up before you get to the patient and can be tested and assure that you have, which means when you do go to the patient, instead of having 10 things to deal with, the trainee only has to deal with two things. And that's the thing for the, uh, the hernia model. I put my trainees through it because we're the only uh, center in Australia who does the laparoscopic hernia repair in children. 
not because we're particularly special, but just because I trained in England and we do them all laparoscopic in England, but not in Australia. Um, so my trainees go through that. When I'm happy they're good on the simulator, they go to the patient. And the thing they find difficult is the interaction with the peritoneum and putting the ports in. The only two things that we don't do, the suturing, the purse string, the tissue handling, all of those other things they're happy with and they actually do perform quite well. Um, so surgical simulation is the acquisition of core surgical skills in a safe environment. You can do feedback, deliberate practice, maintenance of these skills, and you can also test novel technology and techniques as well within a safe environment before going to the patient. So let's go talk about technology and how it can be harnessed. We talked a tiny bit there. So I'm going to talk about my Myanmar experience, obviously, and my great faculty I've got there. But things have actually changed before we get on to Myanmar with COVID, as I'm sure we're all sitting here today. And as we were saying, I think if it hadn't been pre-COVID, it would obviously take a lot longer to organize and obviously travel. So it's a great honor to join you guys uh, today and be able to share these thoughts with you because uh, of technology. So there have been some positives and we have to take away positives to so everything bad that's happened to us recently. But with COVID in Australia, I've changed my whole laparoscopic training program online. So we do laparoscopic training, the students do that at, uh, at home, and I run webinars. So you may now be saying, this is a bit crazy, what does it mean he's doing laparoscopic training at home? Well, these are the people that we've had, every state in Australasia so far have joined us, all successfully going through the program. And how we do that is we have an online training program. They actually have simulators within their home, they log on to my uh, training curriculum, they go through it. They do all the, the tests and as they go through and they get metrics. So you can see here at the bottom of the left hand of the screen, um, I get metrics for them because I get their distance, their handedness, their off screen, the distance between the instruments, the speed, acceleration and motion smoothness because of the motion tracking they've got there. So not only do I watch their videos as I do, you can see the assessed candidate on the right hand side of the screen, I get their time. I can give them grades for the different domains, I can give them written feedback, but I can quantify that. So it's not just me subjectively looking at their performance, it's about actually getting objective proof with technology as well. And this is low cost, it's in their houses, they run through a six week training program and their laparoscopic skills increase. And a big credit to my Myanmar faculty who are going through some horrific times at the moment. And Yinmar, who's one of the best educators I worked with, who was our educational need there. And until the unfortunate events for the military coup, um, certainly we were moving to actually do a remote laparoscopic skills program there with them as well. Um, so between UM1 and Monash Jordan simulation, we were using that technology to actually build up, but unfortunately that's obviously now all on hold as well. And this is thanks to uh, um, a lot of philanthropy within the country at that point, where when we first started, we were in a dark room at the back of a uh, of, a, of a lecture theatre, but now there's actually a simulation, or I uh, hope it's still there, uh, a um, very large simulation lab um, within the heart of Yangon, uh, with importantly good internet capabilities, which we were uh, going to capitalise on. Um, so I wish my Myanmar colleagues well. It's, um, a day doesn't go by where I'm not thinking of them, and I certainly stand with them uh, during these difficult times. So I'm going to do a bit of a segue just into different things here, and think about 3D printing now. Um, this is Paul McMenamin, a close colleague of mine, and he does some amazing work with 3D printing, and you can see what he prints here. Um, and it's amazing stuff. The kind of the fidelity which he uses with his 3D printer are amazing. You may look at these and go, how is this actually relevant to us? But uh, Paul, one of his big projects was he went to Liberia after the Ebola crisis, and he actually built up the anatomy training after Ebola because they, they were using cadavers, but all those cadavers were obviously Ebola. Um, uh, victims. Um, so what he did is he actually printed these, donated them, we got funds to do that, and he actually set up an, an anatomical training lab with these within country, and it meant that actually they could get access to good specimens, there was no requirements for, for storage of it, no uh, threat of um, actually getting, you know, viruses or other things transmitted from them, they didn't need to be refrigerated, and there was no cost, no ongoing cost for it, because actually store cadavers is a huge ongoing cost. Uh, for these institutions. So in partnership with high income countries, you can set up labs within low and middle income countries to actually continue to do good uh, educational um, uh, streams as well. And Paul's done a very good randomized controlled trial where he got our medical students to basically through three arms. He gave the, uh, one group traditional cadavers for uh, cardiac anatomy, 
uh, one just with the 3D prints and one with a mixture between the two of them. And the most important thing is in the post-test scores, you can see actually it was the 3D print group um, who did the work best. And Paul thinks that this is actually because the students were interacting more with it. They were picking the prints up, they were looking at it, changing it around, really getting up close and looking at the actual anatomy, that they had a much more enriched uh, learning experience because of that. Whereas with the cadavers, they're obviously sitting in these jars or they're there, it's, they, it doesn't give you the same level of interaction as you do. Again, has to be based on evidence as well. And when we've done 3D printing, this is a coelidocal cyst that I excised, which was one of our first case stories, where we actually used uh, preoperative imaging to actually uh, generate a, uh, a pretty re uh, accurate replica of the uh, coelidocal cyst before I excised it and we compared it afterwards. So uh, we're certainly moving towards not only education, but also bespoke uh, patient planning. And I'd love the day which we're moving towards where I can get uh, the 3D printed uh, model for a patient's anatomy, uh, which is actually consistent of the same type of tissues with the same fidelity that I can do the operation on the 3D print before I do it on the patient. And I think that'd be incredibly, uh, and that's coming. We, we are making a lot of big uh, um, uh, strides in it. And I say we, it's more my uh, very clever um, colleagues at Monash University who are doing this with, in conjunction with me uh, for that. So the future directions, so you can see here, this is 3D printing with the latex for Judean and Atresia repair. Um, and it's good, but not actually as great as it can be. And this is obviously the Judean or Judean ostomy that we do because the, the needle does cut out. But you can see here, this is one of the other projects, a student that I supervise, um, who was doing some very good um, uh, 3D printing uh, with more malleable, more uh, realistic uh, type synthetics as well. And this is for difficult airway intubation. And this was Matthew did some excellent work with this. So let's talk about quickly about wearable technology. So wearable technology is something. So whenever Microsoft gets involved in something, that's when things expand. Um, and we are very much in medicine off, off run on the coattails of these kind of things. And this is where um, uh, mixed reality headsets, this is where they're called mixed reality because you can still see your normal visual field, but the headsets drop holograms within it. So you can still see, so it's mixed, whereas augmented reality is where you're looking through a computer screen or you're looking at a slave unit or robotic and it has images on it. This is where you're seeing the real world, but it's dropping things in. Why has this become successful? What's driving Microsoft behind it? Uh, for some of this may resonate with some of you, it's Minecraft. So this is a huge industry where people are now doing Minecraft around a table, watching, doing it with holograms as it's projected onto the table. So let's capitalize on these kind of things where that's so much money going into it for the gaming industry and we can capitalize it on it for um, simulation as well. And this is a video um, just to show, it's from CEA Healthcare. And you can see here, this is the, the real mixed reality. You've got a, mon a mannequin, which is a pregnancy mannequin. You can see this is the interaction with the holograms. And you can see the baby is actually then projected onto it. And this is for shoulder dystonia, where then actually you get the hybrid simulation between mixed reality. You see the head coming out. Can you see how the hologram rotates with the head as well? It then gives you, when they're pulling the, the mannequin and trying to deliver the baby safely, you can then see the pressure, the neck force indicates it comes through. You can see what happens with the, with, the, um, uh, with the hip as well. So the hip's getting more dilated. That's why you're putting the legs up. So this is the new generation of where we would do mixed reality. This is where it's coming and where it's very exciting for that as well. There have been some very good um, studies with actually dropping 3D uh, CT scans uh, for orthopedics onto bad fractures. And you can see here a surgeon um, by Pratitol is actually looking at the, at the holograms projected onto a patient to help guide the surgery. And what are we doing at MCS for this? So this is me uh, with some of my uh, medical students who we have quite a lot of research students who come through us. And this is John, who's in the background, uh, who's very good at these things and actually spent a year with us doing this. So I'll present some of his work to you. But what he actually did for the motor project is that, and we uh, credit to a VARS unit who uh, designed some software for us, but we've got different trainees uh, and experts to basically do tasks. Two of them are manual dexterity, two are more surgical specific. So instrument tying, hand tying, and then some surgical uh, dexterity tests. 
the images here we um, is one of those things which uh, John spent many a week trying to figure this out. But we did hand map, thanks to our uh, technological colleagues, uh, for the image capture, the slightly off uh, quill. <clears throat> But actually, these holograms were exactly mapped to the hands, so we could then map the hand movement using the new software that we created for the surgeons. Um, and this is the interface you can see here. This is in the operating room theatre among us children. You can see the drop down menu. You can see the task there. You can see a little box around one of the tasks because that's where it's centered in, where that's going to be the point of origin. And we had 34 participants of different uh, degrees of surgical expertise going through. And you can see here that it was significant for the part the, for the, the total path length for the left and right hands irrespective of whether you which hand you were and you can see here also the total path length was significant as well as the total time so using the hololens i can get objective data for actually people doing open surgery as well as i can for laparoscopic surgery so the next stage of the project is to get surgeons to wear these while they're doing procedures in the operating room and see whether i can quantify that so we're no longer going to assess our trainees just on me looking at them and going, yes, I think that operation is quite good. I'm going to be quantifying it with objective data as well and putting them onto a scale, which they can then use for self-directed learning as well. I'm also doing a new test. So this is something that's uh, uh, for those of you who are surgeons, so 70% of uh, surgeons will have problems with uh, musculoskeletal problems moving forward. So we're using a, a ready-made sensor in the operating room to actually look for um, uh, ergonomics. You can see here, this is me operating on a neonatal unit, and you can see our ergonomics are very good. Um, so anything that we can do to improve this, we're trying to look into, because we have to work in very small confined spaces, because we have to go to the baby rather than the baby uh, coming to us. So I'll keep you updated on that one. Again, a low cost sensors that we, we will use, uh, but we're getting some interesting data from there. <clears throat> so that's wearable technology and you can get an idea of where you're going. I mean, getting a, a few HoloLens headsets, the price will come down as they take off. People can get more. The price of HoloLens 2 is already less than HoloLens 1. So these kind of things could be where that's the next expansion. And there's some very good groups in India already who are using this and certainly overtaking a lot of labs in Australia as well. So just to close, I'm just going to go through the example of that, uh, which was actually my invite. <laughs> Thank you very much to talk a bit about the global surgery and an interception project we had in Myanmar. Um, and so why do we do global surgery? So global surgery, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is that uh, essentially low resource settings are transitioning to new systems as educational reform um, and simulation can su supplement this, but they can also learn from the mistakes in high income countries. So uh, in England, when we first introduced lap cholecystectomies, there was a much higher rate of common bowel duct injuries. Was that because the surgeons weren't good? No, it's because they weren't trained on the new equipment. So we can help people actually get decrease the learning curves and actually learn from our mistakes uh, of which we made for laparoscopy. Now for interception, for those who don't know, majority are idiopathic, although they can be pathological as well, where you get little swellings of the lymphoid hyperplasia within the bowel. The bowel then goes intercepts within itself and it then blocks off its own blood supply and you can get bowel necrosis and, and death potentially. And these are the little hypertrophy fibers. Um, and you can treat it with an operation. You can do an operation either open or laparoscopic to actually remove it. And you can see the bowel intercepted there. But what we're doing in high income countries now is an air enema, where we put air up the bottom, and we push the bowel back the other way by inflating the air. And that can be done with water, hydrostatic, or air. We tend to use air enema uh, primarily in our setting. And in our setting at Monash Children's Hospital, 90% of children will have an air enema and the interception will go back. So a lot of children, it's now becoming a non-operative way to treat this. Um, so what happens in low and income countries in terms of where Myanmar is? Well, Myanmar, we have no idea. The data was very lacking. As you probably know, they came out of the military dictatorship only 10 years ago. And unfortunately, they've gone back into it now with the junta. Um, but it's a very big population and there's only nine pediatric surgeons, uh, less so now actually. We did expand to about 17, but now we're not expanding as much. Vietnam, high incidence of interceptions compared to Melbourne, so we think this is a bigger problem uh, than it is elsewhere. Um, and Thailand, again, different data sets, but it is a, it is a problem, probably less so, but differing uh, problems. And you can see that the air enema success rate is actually relatively high in this region. So potentially air enema would work in Myanmar. 
And why are we doing this? It's a big problem, as I'm sure you know, for the Lancet Commission as well. As, as you know, I probably don't need to say this is probably familiar in all of our, our minds as surgeons, uh, but it's a huge problem where we're now moving away from vaccines uh, towards more uh, in terms of the actual global surgery. So this is our Myanmar program, and I think it's probably extended a bit from uh, our days at uh, the Harvard Macy Scholars. Um, but this is actually the program which we've designed over the last uh, few years. Um, and as you saw from the introduction, we ran 11 courses uh, in country. And this is the interception which happened at the beginning of those um, this uh, program of courses. Um, for the last three courses, we actually transitioned to my Myanmar faculty. So we handed them all the educational equipment. They were now delivering things in country with our support rather than us delivering it. So certainly a, a very good step towards transition. And we were going to do the course in March until the unfortunate events, which was going to be virtual. So actually they were running it themselves. They're excellent uh, um, educators and they were then building forward. And the simulator, so this is Indy. I've traumatized my, uh, I think she was then um, uh, two or three years old. Um, and she walked into the kitchen as I was drilling holes in babies. And she was like, Daddy, don't drill holes, babies. No, the babies. As I was making holes in synthetic bowel out of stuff I got from a local hardware store. Um, but essentially, I validated this and we validated Indy. You can see the synthetic bowel on uh, the, um, on the x-ray here and we tested it the air enema technique in our setting and we validated it with our own surgeons and the radiologists before going to Myanmar and it cost 16 dollars 16 Australian dollars to make this is then we did an in-situ simulation we donated the machine for them to do it we practiced in-situ simulation and got them to all do it we had videos playing of the actual uh, different scenarios where it would get either get reduced or not. And we also then had the x-rays they could see to make sure they were imaging the correct part of the baby as well. Um, and what we did essentially is over the next um, four years is we collected data. We did a mixed method analysis. We looked at some structured interview with uh, the Myanmar surgeons in 2020, so last year. Um, and we also prospectively collected data as well. And what we saw is that there was a significant drop in the amount of babies having an operation in Myanmar following the introduction of this. You can see it just over 80% down to about 56%, uh, and it then stabilized over the next few years. Um, and you can see also the non-operative rates obviously went up as that went down, um, but the intestinal resection rates also went up. And although it seems a, a bit counterintuitive, you want to resect more bowel because that means the right number of children are having an operation. If you're not resecting much bowel, it, and the reasons for that is necrosis stops the air enema from working, that therefore means that you're actually probably doing too many operations and not enough air enemas. And their results were excellent. Sorry, those are those two things. Low recurrence rates and very high success rate on par with high income countries as well. Prospective data possible because of our excellent colleagues on the ground, but very powerful that you can actually see an in simulation intervention actually worked. But this is important as well, because it's not just that. It's not just about saving uh, the children operations. It also has a knock on effect. So here you can see the air enema group had a much decreased length of stay, less need for antibiotics, less need for drips, less need for fluids, uh, less, uh, less uh, post off device, less uh, need for nutrition as well. All the other things that go through, they go home a lot quicker. Uh, freeze up a bed, freeze up staff, freeze up everything else. Obviously, no surgical complications that you have to deal with either. So it has a big effect on the healthcare system as a whole. You can see four days as opposed to seven. But if you look at that spread, you can see the air enema is actually all with a nice group. But you can see some children stay for a month uh, with um, uh, the operative intervention. Um, and the duration of symptoms was also significant. So there was a bit of patient selection in the fact that they had a longer duration of symptoms, they probably had an operation, but then that's probably okay in the initial stages as well. So we proved that on Kirkpatrick's level four, we improve patient outcomes by simulation intervention. And that's certainly something very powerful, which we should all try and achieve, but it's actually very difficult to achieve in many settings. We did the qualitative and this really uh, helped us uh, get to the, the um, uh, crux and really go to the data itself and we figured out that actually uh, a lot of the patient selection was that they could only do it within daylight hours and that did explain a lot of the results we had but these interviews gave us a lot more uh, qualitative data which I, I won't really have time uh, to expand on today. So this demonstrated basically sustainability over the four years. Patient outcomes got better, 
using low cost simulation and 16 Australian dollars to actually uh, do it. And the machine we actually donated to them uh, was actually designed by our Vietnamese colleagues who we've been working with over the years and only cost $100 as well. So all very low cost. And we made sure that when they used it, they used the equipment that was available in country. And they've actually achieved international gold standards. Um, and they're integrating into on their, on their own self-delivered simulation-based medical training as they're going along. And as we said, far-reaching clinical effects as well. But there's also been a paradigm shift. And I think that the success of the simulation program in Myanmar was actually also down to the fact that early on we had a success. And that really helped buy into simulation, the fact that they could see that there was a benefit. They could see what was happening to the children. And they really could see that there was a difference there. And the mixed method approach is very good. I think as, as surgeons, we, we always cower away from uh, qualitative stuff. We want our p-values, we want our data and our tables, um, but the qualitative is much more powerful in many ways and combining the two is perfect. Um, and it's also indicated that actually we don't need to push. Maybe the right number of children are having an interception because of late presentation in Myanmar. And that actually having, you know, rather than 90% having it, which we have in our country, maybe actually having 50 to 60% having an error is actually achievable and actually the gold standard for that setting. So simulation, is it see one, do one, teach one? Probably not. Is see one, practice many and obtain feedback and do one. Admit is not as catchy. I'm probably going to have to work on that to make it a bit more catchy because see one, do one, teach one suddenly rolls off the tongue a lot better. So in summary, um, there's been rapid evo uh, evolution of simulation-based education from my days of bribing people with chocolates to use surgical equipment. The evidence base is increasing and we need to do that as well. It shouldn't just be us playing around with expensive toys. It should be us validating things, having good scientific basis, proving results, looking at clinical outcomes, and really proving that there actually has an effect. And it will be technological driven, but we can also harness new technologies from other realms. And low cost simulation is very powerful and can be used in any setting. So wearable technology, I think is gonna be there. Pressure sensors, I think, um, I'm not sure about your, your group, but I think the majority of my theater staff now have a, a, a tracker of some kind in terms of a Fitbit or you know a, a walk, a step monitor and all those things. It's coming, everyone's having it as well. And we need to hovers, harness these technologies for clinical gains. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much again for the invitation to talk. It's, um, it is a great uh, privilege to do this and also a great sign of where we are in the world that we can do this and share ideas and cross pollinate uh, between uh, different groups of people in different parts of the world easily now. Um, and this is where um, obviously in the children's hospital, this is where Darth Vader then borrowed our simulation uh, uh, center to then give a bit of a prep talk to his troops about how he was actually uh, defeated everyone there. But anyone else is as big as geek as I am. Um, so thank you very much. And I probably should uh, think we're okay on time to open it for questions. Yeah. Thank you, Ram. That was a very nice talk. And it actually took us through uh, what is an introduction to surgical simulation based uh, surgical education and then you shared uh, your experiences of uh, building in low cost as well as moving on to the high end of the spectrum. Actually, what was what stood out for me from the entire talk was that actually this one very nice paper which came out quite some time back about uh, it's simulation which counts, not the mannequins. Uh, it was titled that and it came from, I think, uh, John Hopkins uh, that so it uh, what uh, your glove model, what you bribed your staff nurses to do the double glove model. I think that proves that point very nicely. And the other thing which uh, is a basis what we keep telling in surgical uh, or in any simulation based education, it is that fidelity which counts rather than actually the cost of the mannequin. Like that, your example of the 3D mannequin, I think was a perfect example to go by that. Uh, I have one question, like it was uh, very interesting that uh, you had uh, plotted the novice and intermediate and expert surgeons with regard to the time taken, hand movements, uh, expertise in getting them again, retraining and going before a major case, etc. What is the acceptability, especially with regard to maintaining or continuous skill maintenance from the groups? Uh, I'm sure the residents and the trainees uh, would accept it much more readily compared to the maintenance of skills uh, particular perspective. That, that's, that's an excellent question because it's, um, 
uh, it actually there is a resistance. Uh, you're right um, for experts to to do that. It's almost like we we cross that magical threshold when we become a consultant, where we don't need to train anymore. And I think that certainly the maintenance of skills is something that uh, there is a resistance to. And I'm not sure why, because uh, you know I'm a consultant surgeon. I, I'm, I get very good results, but I'd, I like to maintain my skills as well. I like to to practice. And I think you know the same way, like the parallel with. Um, you know, uh, playing an instrument or, uh, you know, playing chess or things like that as well. You know, you do have to practice as well. So I think for me, I try and put aside uh, my inner resistance to that by putting my patients first and saying, actually, this is going to benefit my patients. It's not anything to do with me. But you're right. Um, there have been some uh, qualitative studies from surgeons and there's a bit of resistance. It's kind of like this is all training to get to a consultant. But when you're a consultant, you don't need that anymore. You know, you, you're there, you can do whatever you want. So, so I think you're right, it's, it's interesting. And I think so the two ways that we have to do it is, and I think certainly we're winning over the um, trainees and the medical students coming through now, because actually my medical students, I don't know about yours, are demanding this. They're demanding things that they want to do things. They're, they're, they're very uh, dedicated and self-directed learners. They want, they know about the simulation, they want to do things and things like that. Um, and so the demand is there for them and that actually the trainees are now demanding more. So I think that's where surgical simulation is building up and it's gaining momentum as, as we're seeing. And now we have to work on our trainers as well. So we have to maybe change people from a educator or uh, to a trainer or a trainer to an educator. What I mean by that is that we're all trainers. So all surgeons will train people in the operating room, but actually they're not many necessarily educate their trainees at the same time. That's looking at them more wider things. So I think it's a great question. I think you're right. We have to now concentrate on ourselves uh, to concentrate in actually changing our shift and uh, the paradigm shift as well. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, we are in COVID times. We could equate this with herd immunity, right? So they say that if you can um, uh, immunize 80% of the population, the virus is not going to do. So if we can actually immunize 80% of the senior surgeons to accept to newer technology, then the system per se will change. And we would go into Kirkpatrick's level four for almost all our interventions. So oh, thank you very much for answering that question. Uh, Dean, sir, you want to say something? I think your voice is not audible, sir. Your voice is not audible. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I don't see any questions in the chat box. Dr. Vishnu, but any uh, reactions, comments, feedbacks, questions? Yeah, the talk, as you said, uh, was very interesting. I had one question in the sense, uh, mostly we train them in the skill lab or after the skill lab, uh, they have experience in their real life also before they get certification. Hmm. Yep, yeah, uh, no, that's that's a great question. So I think uh, as with the one of the reasons I put the building blocks up there is that that's what we do. So um, uh, an example is say my inguinal hernia, where um, I get my trainees to use the model. They then operate with me and they see me doing it, and you can see that they go, "This looks really easy. It's just you just go around. How difficult can it be?" So there is a stage in the learning cycle where then you then have to get them to have a go. They do the real operation in the clinical setting. And then they go, oh, actually, it is more difficult than it looks. Um, okay, I need to go back to, uh, and obviously you do that under supervision so the patient, the patient's safe. Um, but then they need to have that balance between the simulation lab and the operating theater to then realize where they are. And I think that comes to where they're sort of an unconscious uh, competent or incompetent, where they don't know that they can't do it. And they see people doing it saying, oh, it's very easy. So you do need to have that combination of the both. And that's a very much key. So thank you. Thank you for highlighting that. Do the patients cooperate uh, with people for examination? Because I've seen one article where many Western countries, people even qualify the undergraduation without even seeing patients in terms of. Wow. So, not all places. Yeah. No, I, I think, um, yeah, that's that's incredible, isn't it? I think um, I can't imagine qualifying without seeing real patients. <laughs> um, it's a, but I, I think that the one thing, although obviously I, I'm very biased towards these techniques, but I think that uh, the best way I could sum it up is that these are never meant to replace clinical teaching or clinical experience. 
they are all techniques to supplement it and make it better. So, so I think that, as, as you said, you know, if some places are training without seeing patients, that horrifies me because it has to be a balance between all of it. And, and these are all techniques that we can use in the same way that we can give our students a textbook and say, you need, you need to look at this or an octave book and you need to go through it. Um, but it has to be all in conjunction. And these are all tools that we can use, but they're never tools that you can use just by themselves. So they have to be all in conjunction the same way that you wouldn't just train someone up in the clinical field without getting them to have background knowledge to read and get or improve their basic science skills as well. So um, you, you wouldn't do that either, would you? So I think that um, you're right. It has to be a balance between all of them. And I'm certainly, although I think I have been called a simulation a bit sort of a, a fanatic at times, but it's, it's um, for me, it has to be combined together and to supplement real clinical exposure um, and to enhance that clinical exposure, but never replace it. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Ram, look, Dr. Am, I, am I audible now? Yeah, 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 yeah now you are audible. Sir. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Kutu, I'm the, to welcome in the beginning you know, of this technology took me here. Okay, anyway, I have uh, one, one excellent uh, lecture. I really envy that, you know, you are working in such a high technology uh, environment, you know, it's only for us a picture. Now, my question is, you know, this is fine. Some issues are the fidelity versus validity, and another one is reliability and uniformity. See, these will vary. Suppose, you know, fidelity. It goes on increasing every time you are alter the fidelity, you will have to have uh, uh, the the validity uh, off and on. You have to test it. This, these relations are there, and to complicate further the feedback to the person who is getting trained. Mm -hmm. So these issues, what uh, what are your thoughts? You know, the instructor has to be like a good teacher. You know, he 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 is accredited, he is trained, he got a feedback like that. The instructors for these. Training also need to be uh, kind of a standardized. So these will have a all indirect bearing, a direct bearing on overall outcome of how well a surgeon gets trained in this environment. Yes, yes, uh, uh, very, very valuable points, and I agree. And I think I could, I could probably talk um, for hours. I, I wrote a um, a very long essay about the differences between fidelity and realism and functional task alignment, all of which go there. And I think you're right. Um, but I think that as faculty, um, investing in your faculty and training them is key as well, because I've seen some anaesthetists train um, uh, uh, people how to intubate because they're excellent educators on a, on a bottle of Coke. Whereas I've seen people fail to do it on a high tech simulator, um, which is really, really high technology. So I think you're very much right. It's, it's not just to do with the model it's not and there are other factors that come into it it comes in the training themselves whether they're in a good uh, mental state to actually be trained but also the faculty and i think that we need to invest in our faculty and our teachers as well as as you said because um there's only so much you can do and i think actually the quality of the teaching of the faculty is more important than anything else and i think as, as we talked about i think i've seen in simulation centers where um, they buy Sim Junior, so eighty thousand dollars, and they sit around and look at it and go, "Okay, what are we going to teach on this?" Whereas what they should be saying is, "What do I want to teach, and what do I need to teach on?" So instead of buying the equipment, they should first think about what they're doing, which is what everyone at the university obviously does as educators. We think about what are our learning objectives and how can we achieve those. Um, so I think those are very valuable points. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ron. And what about the feedback, you know? Ah, the feedback, yes, feedback. sorry. Yeah. Um, so you, you saw in my definition the feedback was very much a part of it. And I think it's very much, as we said in deliberate practice, is that feedback is there. Without feedback, feedback. no true learning can, can occur. So you're very much right. I think, you know, um, you need to have that feedback. You need to have uh, constructive feedback. You need to know how to improve. And so even if you're doing self-directed learning, self-directed learning, even with technology, you need to have points. So that's why we do the webinars with our remote laparoscopic training. They work with themselves 
and they do a lot of hours on themselves but then i then give them feedback via the online system and then i give them live feedback during the webinars when i can see them live operating so you're right no no learning can happen without the provision of good feedback and actually that is key um to to all learning so yes no that, that's yeah i completely agree thank you thank you once again Absolutely yes, pleasure. Yeah. Then, uh, uh, Dr. Ram, I think that you nicely demonstrated that not only that uh, you could achieve all three levels of Kirkpatrick's. Normally, we do one. We have no problems doing two also. Okay, change in behavior. Uh, sometimes uh, most we we are able to study and demonstrate, but it is the pa patient safety or change in patient outcomes which is difficult. And now that uh, we need to show actually Kirkpatrick level five, the modified Kirkpatrick's, which is the return of investment. Yes. Very true. Very very true. Yes. And uh, with your uh, not only level four but also level five of Kirkpatrick's, I think that is the takeaway from us. It is uh, creativity which counts. It is uh, uh, fidelity which counts, and uh, it is also the simulation part of it. Even if we are teaching a simple task training, but if we can actually uh, make it go along with a case-based scenario, make it go along with a standardized patient who can give a history when you combine task training efforts. So I think that's the lesson we take from today's talk. Thank you very much for sharing our expertise with uh, your expertise with us. And uh, this is Dr. Mahalakshmi, Dean Health Professions Education, thanking everyone on behalf of the Scientific Society of AVMC, which is uh, part of the Vinayaka Missions Research Foundation. Thank you, Dr. Ram. Uh, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this meeting. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye bye, everyone. And. Bye. And for the information of the participants, uh, we'll be having another interesting webinar next week. We'll uh, uh, communicate to you through email and our uh, groups. Uh, we'll be sending the link for this YouTube link for today's session, as well as the participation certificate to all the uh, people present in that. I'll be sending the YouTube link to you, Dr. Ram. Thank you very much. Bye bye. We'll close the session today. Thank you.